and in the audience to our session on entitled Decolonizing for the Planetary Community. Um, I have these lovely bios for everyone, but I'm just going to introduce everyone by name so that we don't spend a lot of time on the bios. If you would like uh, more information, uh, I'm happy to share that with you. We have with us today, first up, uh, Professor Jay Johnston uh, from the University of Sydney. We have um, Carol Wayne White from Bucknell University. We have Lisa Stenmark, who is University of San Diego, sorry, <laughs> University of San Jose um, Emeritus. And we also have Kaku von Stuckrad, who is from the University of Groningen, and myself. I'm gonna, um, <laughs> uh, I'm sort of the moderator and um, a speaker. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and get right into the paper so we don't uh, spend a lot of time on... Whitney, yes. Can I interrupt you? Sorry. I just got a, a message from Mary Keller who says that she's unable to join the live stream. Okay. Um, Amanda will take care of that. Thank you. Thank you. Didn't know how to do that, so... Yeah. Okay, great. So um, we will start with uh, Jay Johnson. Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Whitney. Um, I'd like to commence by paying my respects to the Nuone, the traditional owners of the very beautiful country from which I'm speaking to you today. I acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water and culture, a land that has never been ceded, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country upon which you are and pay my respects to the elders past and present on those lands. I'm very honoured to be speaking alongside such esteemed colleagues today, and I thank Whitney and Koku for the organisation of this panel. The first part of my paper...
hate, its latent presence than the human animal, they are much more united in its occurrence in birds and their use of it for the orientation and navigation. It is not only that other than human species have different sensory systems and perceptive capacities, but that in any given species class, for example, aves, a great range of diversity can exist between species. As Graham Martin writes in Bird Senses, in effect, each species lives in a different secret world. Species may share the same environment, but the worlds that they inhabit are different, end quote. As Martin puts it clearly, there are many different, I quote, bird's eyes views. This challenge to the singular also extends to traditional approaches for investigating animal perception. This is the challenge taken up by sensory ecology. Considered an aspect of behavioural ecology, sensory ecology encompasses understanding the many different sensory systems that animals have, how they function and how the species use them. In addition to investigating how multiple senses interact, sensory ecology research also challenges preconceptions about the role of any individual sense in a specific type of environment. For example, recent research by Gemma Carroll and Ben Pitcher has evidenced that little penguins utilise the sense of smell while they are underwater to locate food. That is, essentially, they create dinner maps of the ocean. Understanding how avian species perceive the world can make a useful contribution to conservation practices. For example, assist in the design of programs and environments to protect species be of crucial importance to the successful reintroduction of captive bred animals like the critically endangered region honey eater chicks that are being taught to sing by, musical, uh, by music therapists, human species music. taste, touch, smell, and even the detection of the Earth's magnetic field used in various combinations, end quote. It just may be that the duration, repetition, and relations of familiarity developed by time spent bird watching by humans, for example, that is actively cultivating multi-sensory relations, enables us both to glean a little of avian worlds and expand our own perceptual literacy. In bird mania, Bernd Brunner recounts 19th century records of the relationship between James, the lyrebird, and a Mrs. Wilkinson, who lived a solitary existence in a remote mountain valley preserved for wildlife. Their relationship was characterised by Ambrose G. H. Pratt as close, almost telepathic. One example of this relation records nausea beset her, that is Mrs. Wilkinson, and for several hours she lay prostrate, wondering in the intervals between spasms of acute sickness how long a time must pass before some tradesman or neighbour might come to whom she could appeal for help. She fell at length into an exhausted slumber to be awakened by strange scratching sounds outside her bedroom window. They continued for at least an hour. Then suddenly the head of her beloved bird appeared in silhouette against the sill and James began to sing to her as she had never heard him sing before. This lovely miracle cured Mrs. Wilkinson more effectively than could all the physicians in the capital, end quote. While we can and definitely should consider this prose within the discursive tropes of its times and all the kind of problems that come along with that, of note in this context is the perception of human-bird relational healing and the rendering of relations founded on something other than the five senses of empirical science reductively considered, and that this close personal relation emerged and developed over time. 
This relation was not a reading of the species' appearance symbolically. Birds, of course, have long been agents in systems of symbols, omens and divination from ancient auguries, medieval bestiaries to contemporary animal spirit dictionaries. Birds have featured a portents of the political and the personal. Nor was this type of specific relational knowing unique as I discovered and have previously blogged about after presenting a public lecture on birds, signs and symbols at a bird watching festival. The real joy of that presentation manifested after the event, for in the time that followed, many a participant told me of their own very personal relationship to a particular bird from a particular species. It was clear that these were sincere human bird engagements in which meaningful communication and connection took place. The accounts interweaved personal biography and cultural tradition, specific place and shared life challenges. Learning to see and hear such bird relations requires a discipline, one that my um, discussants had developed over quite some time of careful observation and environmental familiarity and literacy. Each relation was multisensory and required that the individual viewed the world differently, allowed valued knowledge to be held equally by the avian species and themselves. On considering this multisensory world and the sensory alterity that sits at the heart of any interspecies exchange, it is nonetheless requisite to simultaneously acknowledge that we can never know how we appear to our feathered cohabitants, but nonetheless that they look back. Understanding some of the complex differences of that vision should destabilise or, any under, or undermine any assumption of human mastery. Sensory ecology asks, what actions can we take to be more sensitive to the species with which we share the world? And further, this paper has sought to demonstrate that there are several orders of sensory alterity. Firstly, there's acknowledging the vastly different ways that avian species, as one example, perceive the world. And secondly, it's actively cultivating relations of multisensory exchange that potentially cross epistemological eye other boundaries including modes of knowing relating beyond the ken of empirical knowledge. Such communication requires the need to look askance to see clearly. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, next up we have uh, Lisa Stenmark. And Lisa, if you need to share your screen, you should be able to do so. I can't hear you though. Okay, now you can hear me. I yes. don't, oh, there's my share screen option. Okay. There you go. Got it, okay. I'm assuming that shows up and everything. It's all good. Yay, life is beautiful. Um, okay, um, so I'm want to focus uh, on for my my comments today, it's not really a paper, but I want to uh, focus uh, in my comments uh, on this this question of uh, this word decolonizing um, and what it means to decolonize the planetary community or decolonizing planetary thinking, whatever. I'm really focusing on this word uh, decolonizing, and the, the problem I want to sort of reflect on is uh, what happens when those of us in the Western Academy start speaking of decolonizing. Uh, and it strikes me that um, that we too often skip the actual decolonizing part of decolonizing, focusing instead on a discussion of the concepts, methods, and approaches in need of decolonizing or those that represent decolonial positions. Um, and I mean, I, I don't, I want to make sure that, that I mean, I'm including myself in this, right? Uh, you know, A, we, we are academics. Um, this is what we do. We think about these these concepts, but I think it also reflects uh, the ways that decolonizing is a messy, drawn out uh, process for which there is no set blueprint. Right? I mean, all of us occupy these different locations within the colonial matrix, and so what decolonizing means in that context is different. But then there's also that sort of messy messiness. So um, I'm I'm in Wyoming. Um, I am on, on land uh, that 
people were forcibly removed from uh, in order to give it uh, to other people who uh, accumulated a lot of wealth. And I can acknowledge the people who the land, I got the land from, but I'm not really ready to give it back, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think that might be uh, something that, uh, that um, you know, people should start pushing me on at some point. Uh, and, and I know that there are people in this room that might want to. Um, so, so, so it's really comfortable. I, I like talking about decolonizing and thinking about it. I think it's useful, but the, the, the question is, um, you know, how, how much, how far we can go in discussing uh, colonizing, uh, decolonizing as a theoretical uh, element. So, because of course, by, by focusing on conceptual decolonization, it allows us, as I say, to avoid uh, this, this messiness and also the contradictions uh, for social and environmental justice. Um, so, you know, again, I'm in Wyoming. Uh, what does decolonizing mean in Wyoming and how does that decolonizing in Wyoming impact the poor, uh, impact racial justice, impact social justice? So there's all this sort of messiness in the, in the middle that this term uh, decolonizing sort of uh, disguise, disguises. So uh, my, for my brief comments today, um, and as I said, it's not a paper, it's more of a reflection. I, I want to problematize this idea of decolonizing, decolonizing the planetary uh, community, mostly drawing on um, Eve Tuck and Wayne, uh, K. Wayne Yang's paper, uh, decolonizing uh, is not a metaphor as a way to focus my discussion, because otherwise I will take much more than my time, uh, and tease out a few of the relevant challenges and, and questions that I think that this particular uh, paper uh, poses, uh, uh, although I'm assuming that at least some people uh, in this room would be familiar uh, with their argument. Um, I'm going to begin with a brief summary of their critique of, the, of this use of the term decolonization, uh, as well as uh, their suggestions uh, for um, uh, for alternatives, um, and I'll conclude with some very brief thoughts on how this both uh, challenges and offers construction constructive directions for uh, planetary thinking. And as I said, this is very preliminary, and I sort of welcome pu pushback both to how far I want to go and how far I do not uh, want to go in our discussion. Uh, so in their essay, decolonization is not a metaphor. Uh, Tuck and Yang uh, take issue with, quote, the ease with which the language of decolonization has been used to supplant or supplement prior ways of thinking about social justice, critical methodologies or approaches, which decenter settler perspectives. In other words, sometimes the word decolonizing has been used sort of as a metaphor or in addition to or on top of uh, other calls for social justice. They argue that this turns the concept to be of decolonizing into a metaphor that then represents a whole host of somewhat vague social justice concerns. This process of metaphorizing, I like that, metaphorizing decolonization is accomplished through a host of evasions that treat decolonization as something that is intellectual and academic rather than something that is material and substantive. This turns decolonization into an empty signifier to be filled with any track towards liberation, allowing people to equivocate the contradictory desires of settler colonialism and reinforcing settler moves to innocence that reconcile settler, settler guilt and complexity, <laughs> sorry, complicity and subverts the very possibility of decolonization. Decolonize a verb and decolonization, a noun, cannot easily be grafted onto pre-existing discourses and frameworks, even if they are critical, even if they are anti-racist, and even if they are justice frameworks. Decolonizing is distinct from other social justice projects. It's not swappable. It does not have a synonym. It concerns repatriation of indigenous land and life, it is not a metaphor for other things that we want to do. Now, this does not mean that we should abandon other pursuits of social justice. What it does mean that that what it does mean is that considering how the pursuit of critical consciousness, the pursuit of social justice through critical enlightenment, can also be settler moves to innocence. That is diversions and distractions which relieve us of the feelings of guilt or responsibility. And I would add, sort of, relieves us of the need to act 
uh, and thus conceals the need to give up land, power, or privilege. Uh, in their essay, Tuck and Yang explore the various ways that uh, metaphorizing decolonization reinforces settler moves to innocence. I'm not gonna talk about uh, all of them here. Um, uh, uh, and relieves us of settler guilt, uh, but I'm going to just uh, touch on a couple, uh, uh, and uh, which are sort of uh, intertwined. One is what they, what they refer to as colonial uh, equivocation, and this is where we sort of group social justice movements together, uh, and this becomes a way of avoiding the contradictions within social justice movements, and I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a moment, um, uh, but by by describing all the struggles, uh, uh, it's either struggles against imperialism uh, or struggles uh, against, um, sorry, my cat has just discovered that I'm doing something very important. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm gonna return to this point in a moment. Um, so uh, the other thing is focusing on the on the theoretical. This is the idea that you know freeing your mind and the rest will follow. They make a distinction between the way Franz Fanon uh, approaches uh, this idea that you know the first step is to free the mind and Paolo uh, Fieri's uh, uh, pedagogy of the oppressed, which focuses on mental decolonization with this kind of assumption uh, that once you free the the mind, sort of, it's automatic that these other things. Uh, follow on. She says, that, you know, it's not that mental decolonization is not important, but it is a kind of settler harm reduction. That is, it's uh, that this mental decolonization is a way to respond to the current crisis. It's an immediate, it is, they call it a stopgap. Um, uh, it's a step on the way to uh, something else. Harm reduction is not the same as decolonization, uh, and it does not offer a pathway to, de uh, to decolonization. I want to I'll mention uh, uh, decoloniality here at, at this point, because I kept thinking uh, as I'm sort of reflecting through this, how this relates uh, to uh, this, this, this move to decoloniality. And I think at some point decoloniality becomes the kind of metaphor that they're talking about. Vignolo uh, and others that approach this are very, <laughs> are very clear, uh, you know, that, that, that decolonizing decoloniality is a step towards sort of physical transformation and changes uh, in the material world. So I, I, I just kind of uh, wanted to, to throw that out there. So, so what are some of the alternatives that they approach uh, to, uh, to this, this kind of metaphorizing? Um, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm sort of uh, throwing out just a couple. There's a lot that's going on uh, in this paper. Um, but they really want to focus on materiality, right? That is, it's not a metaphor, it is actually returning land and sovereignty to uh, indigenous people. Um, uh, what they point out is <laughs> that this move to materiality unsettles other movements and trajectories, right? That is that it, it materiality is what reveals the messiness, and they have a lot of examples. But but I want to uh, throw out uh, one of one of my own examples in this, um, and that is uh, in my in my work in Vietnam, uh, uh, thinking with Vietnamese scholars about how to sort of undo some of the hegemony of Western scholarship, which is in itself intertwined with French and American imperialism, and now uh, sort of Western dominated, uh, you know, global standards uh, and, and these other aspects and the way that that colonizes, you know, to use it metaphorically, the way that forces out uh, other, other ways of thinking. And uh, when discussing aspects of indigenous thought that create a way to move forward, uh, some of my Vietnamese colleagues refer to uh, the Vietnamese as indigenous. Um, Vietnamese people are not indigenous to Vietnam in, in many senses of the words, because there are other groups that are indigenous that have themselves been colonized by first the Chinese and then the Viet, um, uh, and are still, you know, it started a thousand years ago and it's still happening today. So th these are still issues um, that this idea, you know, when we use decolonizing or even indigenous sort of almost a sort of metaphorical sort of way, um, it kind of interrupts observing the messiness of talking about decoloniality in Vietnam, right? 
The need to call, decolonize Vietnam in one context is often in tension or at odds with efforts to decolonize Vietnam in these other senses. Um, and I have talked with my colleagues about the point when the government censors realize you know, what we're talking about and that we're talking about minority peoples and not the Vietnamese in relation to the rest of the world might be the last lecture that I give in Vietnam. Uh, so, uh, so there is, um, so there is some of this, this, the, these difficulties uh, that go on uh, when when we do that. So, so reflecting on the way materiality uh, creates all of this sort of complexiness and net me and messiness. They call for an ethic of incommensurability. Now, what an ethic of incommensurability, it acknowledges these distinctions, it acknowledges these messiness, uh, uh, acknowledging what is important in the project of decolonization in relation to other pro projects um, and, uh, and, and where those conflicts uh, come in. And I think that all, once we start thinking about what planetary thinking means or planetary communities means in real concrete forms, I think there we're gonna start seeing that kind of messiness with these other social justice projects, but that isn't something that, that should make us want to avoid it. That's something that when we get into it and start exploring it, I think creates real paths, uh, pathways forward uh, for, for material transformation and for, for actual solidarity. So um, I think, let me get my cat off my paper here. Um, okay, so a couple of, uh, of insights and questions and thoughts that I have uh, in here, and this is again, not meant to be uh, in any way, shape or form, um, um, uh, uh, definitive, uh, and I'm realizing I'm getting out of time, time here, so it got away from me, uh, but, um, but just reminding ourselves you know, that conceptualization is equivocation when it becomes a substitute uh, for action. Talking about decolonizing is irrelevant without the goal of actual material decolonization, and if we're talking about something else, then we should be talking about something else. Um, so when we talk about planetary thinking and planetary communities, what are the material conditions and transformations that that is connected to? Again, that is gonna be the place where the interesting, I think, conversations uh, 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 connected to. Without that kind of material element, this concept of planetary thinking and planetary communities just represents another move to innocence, a way to look like we're doing something when we're not. So action, uh, not abstraction, materiality, not theoreticality, um, uh, you know, sort of putting our money where our mouth is. Of course, that materiality brings in those contradictions um, and we need to explore more of that materiality of, of planetary thinking. I have some more uh, in here, but I just wanna, you know, sort of thinking about the shift to post-human, for example, or the other than human. Um, where does that leave indigenous humans, right? The shift to planetary thinking, if we're thinking about, you know, sort of planetary, I mean, beyond the question of who speaks for the planet, uh, then there is, uh, on a decolonial perspective, you know, a planetary community is still a colonized planet, right? So until we start dealing with that, uh, then that becomes uh, an, an important, I think, an important uh, element. Um, finally, I'll just throw this out here real quick. Uh, uh, although decolonization is not interchangeable with other critical theories or calls for social justice, all projects are legitimate, right? So we can talk, or, or at least potentially uh, legitimate. So when we talk about this whole host of other theories, they all have their uh, their place and their goals. And exploring the materiality of those is the way is the way forward. And giving those other other you know decolonial liberation, critical race theories, disability studies, deconstructive thought, they all have their their place as long as they are connected to uh, this uh, this material uh, uh, element. Okay, I had more to say, but yeah. I'm going to stop. Thank you, thank you so much, Lisa. <laughs> and I am being reminded that if you are watching online, you can tweet your questions to at issrnc, and we will pick those up in the question answer uh, section. But for now, we will go to you, Carol. Okay. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. Sorry. Let me see something here. Uh, 
Um, I cannot share my screen. It says multiple windows. So, uh, Lisa, could you someone un? Just one second. Okay, thank you. Uh, we should be able to. Are you able to do it now? I yeah. Okay, let me try now. Um, try again later, it keeps saying. Okay, just <laughs> Whitney, why don't you just change it to multiple people can share? I am no longer sharing, but if you change it to multiple, that might solve the problem. No, I have done that. Just one second. Sorry. Okay, now try it. Thank you. Okay, let me try now. Um... Still you, won't let me. You shared your screen because now you're um, very uh, large on our big screen here. So you can see it now. Oh, I can't no, see I can't. PowerPoint. We can just see you. Right, but okay. Um, I'm trying to. It still won't let me share my screen. However, so I don't. Uh, just one second. Okay. Sorry. Are you sharing your screen, but just not your your app? Your your presentation um, no I want to share my PowerPoint presentation um, so I was able to do it before but now it won't let me try again later oh. okay sorry mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what to do yeah. yeah. Okay. So wait, uh, why don't we, why don't, should we, let's go to um, Kaku first and then come back. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Kaku, yeah. Can you share, Thank can you. Share Sorry. Your That's okay. Thank you. I don't know what's. Let's see if I can do it. <laughs> Carol, also um, send Amanda your presentation and then we can get, at oh. least get it up here and do it that way. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Can you, there you go, Kako. Okay. Does that work? Yes. Great. Okay, let me see. All right. Uh, let me see. Uh, to jump into it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that that has been great so far, and uh, it's such an such an honor and a pleasure to be with you all and talk about these very tricky and um, important questions about colonial, decolonial, decoloniality and so on. And uh, I also did not really prepare a, um, um, a, a paper to read, but to bring in one or two arguments bas basically that we uh, can discuss uh, later um, in the discussion. And we all know that the debates in, in post-colonial studies and related intellectual fields have significantly raised our awareness of deeply ingrained colonial structures, uh, structures and the need to decolonize our regimes of exploitation at all levels. And we talked about uh, that already. And the material level and the conceptual level um, are intertwined in many ways. And what, what I find interesting that um, it seems that most of these debates on the conceptual and we're talking about the critical theory here, um, focus on the human species and its internal hegemonies and exploitative regimes, while colonial theories are rarely applied to non-human organisms and life forms. And uh, I uh, don't know if Braun is in the room, but uh, I, th I know he's at the conference. And he, um, a couple of years remarked, I quote him, I have often wondered why scholars who are alert to and even outraged by um, human on human imperialism are so often indifferent to the <clears throat> uh, indifferent uh, to the ecocidal domination of humankind over the rest of the living world, end quote. At times, we even see ridicule and disdain toward environmental activism. For instance, when Edward Said called environmentalism, I quote, the indulgence of spoiled tree huggers who lack a proper cause. So I, I just wonder, and I w want to bring uh, this question to the table, how can we explain this? That, that's basically my question. 
And to begin with, um, we, we need to remember that colonialism is part of a larger system of exploitation. And that's not a mystery to any of uh, you or in the room, but I think it's important to um, look at these um, regimes of exploitation as interlocked regimes. Um, and these interlocked regimes uh, of exploitation include patriarchy, racism, capitalism, colonialism, um, anthropocentrism, Eurocentrism, and an extractive approach to the more than human world or the non-human world or the rest of the world. Um, and we, we um, have to look at these um, whole bunch of kind of exploitative or extractive approaches to the world um, that um, legitimize each other in very intricate ways. And uh, when, when I look for an, an illustration of these interlocked regimes, um, I often use um, um, this picture, um, the drawing Allegory of America, which the Dutch Italian painter Jan van der Straat, also known as Stradarnus, drew between 1587 and 1589. The drawing shows the Florentine explorer Amerigo Vespucci encountering the Americas. Vespucci carries a staff with a crucifix at its pinnacle and a banner of the Southern Cross. He also holds a brass mariner's astrolabe, which helped him navigate the seas to find new lands to explore and people to exploit on behalf of Spain and Portugal. In this drawing, Vespucci is um, um, shown naming the allegorical figure America. You can see even the, the, um, the name is um, uh, moving out of his mouth. Um, <clears throat> a feminized version of his own name. Stradanus presents America as a young woman gesturing uh, towards Vespucci from her hammock. She wears only a feathered headdress and skirt, um, her club abandoned against the tree at the right where an anteater is shown feasting. Set behind her in the rolling landscape is a horse and a bear and a scene of cannibalism. So several elements come together here, the identification of the indigenous with nature, um, the feminization of nature and thus also of the indigenous, the domestication or exploitation of nature by culture, and the interlocked system of exploitative regimes. So this is an illustration of what we are dealing with, uh, basically. And um, my point is here that um, to some extent, and certainly when it comes to European philosophy of the second half of the 20th century, and particularly when I look at the Frankfurt School, for instance, to, to use one concrete example, then it might be that critical theory is itself part of a colonial heritage that prioritizes European intellectual positions. Tacitly, it may be contributing to what Bruno Latour called the Great Divide. The Great Divide also produced this kind of critical theory that is not necessarily self-reflective. And that's exactly what um, uh, the, the other point is I'd like to uh, make here, because recently we've seen resistance to this approach. And we've heard already a couple of um, them. and. Um, we will hear more uh, about uh, Sylvia Winter, uh, for instance. I think um, um, uh, Whitney will talk about that. Um, but Sylvia Winter's crucial contribution is that basically uh, we can conclude that a kind of planetarizing of Eurocentric uh, humanism is what we need to do. Uh, we'll probably hear more about that. Um, okay, I also have a next slide here. Um, then, then 
similarly in his book uh, the Cosmo cosmopolitan imagination from 2009 Gerard Delanti argues for a renewal of critical social theory that's the book's subtitle Delanti stresses I uh, quote the growing importance of societies that have emerged from non-western modernities arguing that a genuinely global assessment of the current day needs to be less confident about the centrality of the West and the equation of globalization with westernization." End quote. This resonates with other decolonial arguments, for instance, with uh, Walter Minolo's work on coloniality, um, and we've, uh, Lisa, uh, talked about that already. As uh, Minolo points out, coloniality emerged as a new structure of power during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, when Europeans colonized the Americas and built on the ideas of Western civilization and modernity as the endpoints of historical time. Europe, Europe was constructed as the center of the world and the pinnacle of evolution, and um, Sylvia Winter talks about a uh, similar um, argument. Mignola calls coloniality the darker side of Western modernity, a, a complex matrix of power driven by Christian theology emerging in the 15th century and lasting through the late 20th century and the hegemony of neoliberalism. And what, what's important with uh, Mignolo is that he argues at the beginning of the 20th, uh, first century, coloniality is coming to an end as it is uh, challenged by de-westernization on the one hand and by decoloniality on the other. Decoloniality establishes understandings of modernity that are disentangled from the colonial matrix of power and imagine global futures in which human beings and the natural world are no longer exploited for the sake of capitalist wealth ac uh, accumulation. And against this uh, background, let me also um, point to uh, Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, who makes a similar point in his theory of multinational perspectivism in Amazonia. The challenge is to turn colonial science into a vehicle for the um, permanent decolonization of thought, as he says, by building into it a disorientating capacity to approach a radically multi-perspectival or decentered world. To add just one more name here, what Vivarius de Castro um, uh, calls a multi-perspectival world resonates with Arturo Escobar's concept of pluriversal politics. Okay, so much for the for, for the raindrop, uh, raindrop name dropping. Um, um, just to sum up what, what I'm heading at here is that de-Westernization also needs to be applied to critical theory, which is certainly in its European version, a product of uh, uh, Westernization and coloniality. What would post-colonial theory and decolonization look like if they were built on a bio or ecocentric ethical perspective? What we need is an active merging of post-colonial thinking with insights from critical animal studies. And we heard um, Jay talking about that too, critical post-humanities, eco-feminism, and related fields of inquiry. Or in the language of decolonial thinkers I've mentioned, a biocentric perspective leads to a multi perspective of a decentered world, this, the Euro-American one, and pluriversal politics can help in our attempt to heal the great divide. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, Carol, uh, you're up now. I can pull up your... Um, PowerPoint on my email if you're not able to share your screen. Let's see. OK, 
Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Of course. No, just and just uh, tell me when yeah. to move. Yes. Okay. Um, so can we put it on slideshow? There we go. Can I? Okay, great. And in order for me to, can I? So I'll have to tell you when to move it, yes? Yes, exactly. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, with the others, I'm appreciative of this opportunity to speak with such a wonderful um, colleagues about this topic and thank Whitney and Kaku for envisioning this. My, my presentation today is actually on um, a particular aspect of decolonization that I think is um, coming out of a particular historical moment. It's what I call dec decolonizing matters. Envisioning the Black Lives Matters movement contributions to a more than human politics of nature. I'm ready to next one. Whitney, please. Um, so what I want to suggest then is that um, careful study of the Black Lives Matters principles, literature, rhetorical phrases suggests that um, the movement um, can be um, seen in a much more capacious way than how it's often um, looked at. It's often looked at as a social justice movement. However, in my presentation today, I want to highlight the fact that um, when aligned with what I'm calling religious naturalism, which is a capacious ecological worldview, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement can be seen as contributing, contributing to a more than human or decolonizing deco politics of nature. In my reading, the Black Lives Matter movement uncompromising demand that Black lives be viewed and treated as intrinsically valuable life forms um, reflects religious naturalism, relational ontology. So what I'm going to propose to do in the time allotted to me is to argue that this contemporary protest movement is uniquely positioned to contribute to this distinctive politics of nature that addresses a problematic notion of the human. The next, please. Yeah, number, yeah. Sorry. There we go. Right. So um, in 2014, in the United States, amid the escalating force of police brutality, um, particularly numerous police killings of unarmed African Americans, Alicia Gaza, one of the Black Lives Matters movements, founded this particular movement um, and described it as an ideological and political intervention in the world where black lives are systematically and intentionally targeted for demise. She's highlighting what we are now calling the forces of anti-blackness. The hashtag Black Lives Matters um, 12, 14 years later have come to symbolize a critical black consciousness aimed at embracing and promoting the inherent value of blackness historically, materially, sim symbolically, and existentially in an era still mesmerized by the dangerous construction of whiteness. Next, please. What I have done in my research um, is to look at the Black Lives Matters um, guiding principles. There are a number of them, and a lot of people really have not studied their um, rhetoric and looked at a lot of their literature um, because of some of the negative images of them in the media. But one of the Black Lives Matter's guiding principles focuses on intentional community building in which self-determinant agents create and maintain forms of relationality that help to expand rather than diminish their sense of connections with others. This is from um, one of the websites we intentionally build and nurture a beloved community that is bonded together through a beautiful struggle that is restorative, not depletion. Next, please. What I want to emphasize in um, this moment is that when you actually think about what the Black Lives Matter platform is emphasizing, is really emphasizing the fact that Black lives are material lives, and they are also affirming the affirmation of material life. 
So what I want us to consider and think about then is how um, this particular reframe within the Black Lives Matter movement um, leads to what I'm going to eventually call a politics of nature. Um, one of the questions that I have us thinking about then is how to understand this complex human being that the Black Lives Matter advocates highlight. What do we mean by Black lives? And so one point of entry that I offer today is raising the question about how can we understand the human in a new way, given what the Black Lives Matter movement is advocating. And one particular overlooked and but very important response is actually given by Patrice Kahn's callers herself, one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matters movement. In her 2018 memoir, um, Kahn's caller shared a moving account of listening to a talk delivered by astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson a few days after the September election, um, 2016 election. In a very moving account, Khan's callers actually um, gave us this wonderful, fascinating, elegant truth. Um, we listened together, the very atoms and molecules in our bodies are traceable to the center of stars that once upon a time exploded into gas clouds. And throughout this passage and in summary, what um, Khan, Khan's um, callers is actually highlighting is that black lives are intrinsic valuable life forms. And she also is emphasizing that at its inception, Black Lives Matter was not really about just advocating for black bodies. It was basically advocating for all material lives, because if one aspect of materiality is um, not allowed to reach its potential, all forms of materiality are affected. So it's, it's this one and all type of principle that you find within the Black Lives Matter movement. And so this particular move, which I call a naturalistic move here, to me is where I find the interesting linchpin for understanding um, the Black Lives Matter as more than just a social justice movement. Um, could I have the next one, please? In this particular case, what I again is emphasizing the fact that humans are natural processes. This is a way of dethroning us from this thinking that we're at the center of the universe or thinking that we are at the center of all life. Um, basically, um, with this understanding, this naturalistic turn, we are beginning to think about some of the tenets of religious naturalism. And I want to highlight that in a minute. Um, next, please, Whitney. So what I'm going to do is to um, give a very, very brief overview of religious naturalism, introducing it as a type of critical materialism. Next, please. So I associate religious naturalism with some of the other critical materialisms in which um, you have novel approaches to the category of the human um, while also offering critical insights into the animated more than human worlds that actually support us. And what I want to highlight again here is that with the other um, forms of critical materialism, religious naturalism can contribute richly to our understanding of materiality itself and offer new foundations for envisioning a biopolitical futures. So I posit religious naturalism as one particular vector among many for exploring the rich theoretical potential of materialist discourses. Next. So what does religious naturalism affirm? It affirms that nature is ultimate. It describes nature as the only realm in which human animals in search of value and meaning live out our existence, and it embraces nat nature's richness, spectacular complexity, and fertility. Here I do want to highlight that it's important to recognize with Donna Haraway that the term nature itself is an historically evolving term, and that it is a contested site among various types of thinkers. So uh, in, my, in this context, what I consider as nature is basically a complex, 
endless and evolving set of relations that is part of um, reality or existence itself. So next, please. What I also want to emphasize is the conception of the material emergent relational human in religious naturalism. Basically, um, religious naturalism affirms that humans are ultimately the manifestations of many interlocking systems, natural systems, atomic, molecular, biochemical, anatomical, ecological, apart from which human existence is incomprehensible. So we're embedded in materiality. We are material beings through and through. As this passage from Michael J. Fox um, asserts basically that our bodies contain the mineral elements, primordial rocks, our very cells share the same historically evolved components as those of grasses and trees, and our brains contain the basic neural core of reptile bird and fellow mammal. Next, please. In other words, um, humans are structured by relationality. The very concept of a human is really a trope, in my opinion. We are of life forms, we're material beings, we're animals, but we have chosen to define ourselves as human beings. Um, and so what I want to emphasize in this particular context is that we do not exist apart from our constitutive relationality. Um, we humans share genes with other natural processes and we're connected to them all the way down as this passage from Good Enough affirms. Next, please. So becoming human, um, we, we become human. We create this very idea of what it means to be human. Um, my, what I have written about is that becoming human is recognizing and acknowledging that uh, we, um, this particular type of life form that we call ourselves, um, often have an awareness to be more than just a conglomeration of pulsating cells. Um, it suggests that our humanity is not reducible to the organizational patterns or processes dominated by brain structures, nor do DNA, diet, behavior, and the environment solely structure what we're calling this becoming human. In other words, human animals uh, become human destinies um, when we posit fundamental questions of value, meaning, and purpose to our existence. So um, for me, this um, sums up the whole idea. How do we come to terms with life? We are actually life forms. How do we come to terms with the fact that we are a particular type of life form itself? Next, please. Um, this uh, question for me is the key to understanding how um, the Black Lives Matter movement can become a politics of nature. Here I borrow from Lars Tonder's um, notion of the political and you can read it for yourself, but basically um, he highlights the fact that politics is what happens when connections are created across levels of temporality and when new constellations of human, and I would say more than human forces come into being, um, creating the opportunity for more or less sedimented structures of discourse and embodiment, including culture, economy, and religion. Next. And so I want to return to Con Collar's evocation of Black Lives Matter's affirmation of material life. Um, this is my movement towards uh, suggesting that the Black Lives Matter movement can uh, contribute to a politics of nature. I suggest then that when you hear the Black Lives Matter um, rhetoric suggesting a tradition of Black love um, within the context of religious naturalism, um, we're really hearing the idea that um, black bodies, black lives are part of an appreciable expanded view of materiality. When we affirm that black lives matter, this is part of one of their guiding principles, we need not qualify a position to love and desire freedom and justice for ourselves is a prerequisite for wanting the same for others. Next, please. What I want to do then is to suggest that um, there's a much more expansive way than understanding this idea of freedom, which is what I'm attributing to this decolonizing um, discourse. Next. So when I look at the, um, the philosophies, the uh, ideas coming from the Black Lives Matter movement within the context 
of religious naturalism and its understanding of the emergent relational human being, I basically um, see uh, several contributions. Number one, um, Black Lives Matter is uniquely posited or positioned to affirm religious naturalism rejection of a colonizing legacy that depends on the dominant cultural fantasy of human exceptionalism in all of its forms. And one of the major ones, of course, as we have um, heard throughout this particular um, session is assuming that humans are on one side of the great divide away from all other species. We are actually interspecies beings. Um, another is basically resisting the wide range violence embedded in European colonialism and other forms of colonialism um, around processes of racialization. Um, while Black Lives Matter should continue to do that, it also has the movement, the potential to consider fully the colonization of other natural processes. Next, please. And so what I'm suggesting then is that the Black Lives Matter affirmation of Black lives as invaluable life forms. It's basically suggesting that we live within an appreciable universe. The biosphere is packed with living, interpreting systems well before human beings came onto the stage. Agents who are already possess many of the perspectives that are manifested in higher organisms. Every organism, every living thing is an agent composed of communities, of living parts. They sense or perceive their environment, process data, and make appropriate responses. The life world is agent-centered. It is an ontology of living agents. Next. And so um, I'm going to conclude with saying its particular contribution to a um, politics of nature or decolonizing politics of nature is when you can see and affirm and interpret the Black Lives Matter within this context as ecocentric truths. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement underscores a basic religious naturalist claim that all human endeavors arise from an inextricable network of natural processes that make the very category of the human itself intelligible. Our embeddedness within myriad nature invigorates a fuller sense of our expansive hum humanity is always already entangled, becoming. And final, the last one, I think. Um, so within this context, the Black Lives Matter movement um, activism is crucial within the wider context of the different types of injustices that proliferate around the globe, such as historical injustices, international forms of justice, global, poverty, human rights, and of course, the ecological crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. Um, I want to put everyone in the room at ease. I don't have COVID. Phoenix has done a number on my allergies, so that's what's going on here. I just want to make, I just want to, I feel like I have to say that now. Um, I don't have COVID. Um, okay. So I feel like also I don't really need to say much because my colleagues have said a, a lot and a lot of the things that I want to say. Um, but I will point out that this is the very conversation we're having here today is the one that Florida does not want us to have <laughs> in public spaces, um, every single part of this. Um, and that's what this, my little bit here is a part of a larger, larger project uh, that I think of as undisciplining the university. So if the disciplines of modern Western uh, knowledge production systems have given us climate change and gross economic injustice and the problems that we see in the world today, then it's time to undiscipline our thinking. Um, and that's sort of my own little part. And so I'm going to go through my scaffolding for this project. Um, but I think that it resides on a particular theological anthropology that is a transcendent form of monotheism that says humans are made in the image of God. This is not a new critique, but this is uh, sort of what the scaffolding of the, the problem I see with the humanities today um, is built on. And this hierarchy of um, Christianity in the era of colonization leads to an aesthetic hierarchy, an epistemological hierarchy, a linguistic hierarchy, and a particular version of the modern subject, right? The science of the individual. Um, which a lot of people have talked about. 
Um, Masuzawa points this out in The Invention of World Religions. Um, in the opinion of the theological comparatives, Christianity alone was truly trans-historical and transnational in its import, hence universally valid and viable at any place, any time, whereas all other religions were particular, bound and shaped by geographical, ethnic, and other local contingencies, right? So the, this uh, theological anthropology um, is the basis of, um, of what I see as the colonial mindset. Um, and as uh, other people have mentioned, Sylvia Winter points this out, it's not just a theological concern, but the very human of the humanities in the disciplines that were formed and that it still exists in our university today is an idealized understanding of the human, which is a white European male, a white European uh, Christian male. That is the ideal human of the humanities. And if you start with that, then you have a way to rank all other forms of humanity, right? So Sylvia Winter is, is, is sort of um, arguing for also this undisciplining of the humanities, right? We have to get rid of this concept of the humanities, perhaps with the post-human, um, which is what I, a direction I want to go in, um, in order to undo uh, the, the, the long string of hierarchical isms, <laughs> if you will. Um, Apco, um, in her book, uh, their book, Racism as Zoological Witchcraft, um, says, I, I love this quote very much, um, my goal is to show you how animality, a construct that oppresses anyone who deviates from what our culture considers to be an ideal human, is an integral part of all of the oppression you're already experiencing each day. As people of color, we, she's speaking here, won't reach racial liberation by examining only the violence we experience in isolation from other current social phenomena. We need to understand that this narrative of animality is the real problem, and that in order to meaningfully liberate animals and ourselves, we have to deal with and attack it, right? So she moves towards a, 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 a form of <laughs> um, animism and says, look, if it's, if it's theological anthropology that says there is this idealized human that then gets integrated into the very structure of Western thought and then gets replicated through the production of knowledge throughout a Western style education, then we need to raise it to the ground and reintegrate ourselves um, as part of a much larger um, uh, living planet, so to speak. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> One of the, there are several sort of strains that I want to draw from in order to, to undiscipline the university and, and to sort of rethink things. Um, Kovacs uh, argues, of course, that also the sciences, right, not just the humanities, but the very separation of the humanities and the sciences, and thereby humanities and the study of nature, um, is this sort of Western colonial mindset, right? And the very implication of the productive and reductive model of science that says nature is something different from us is a theological colonization. It's, it's, a, um, it's an imposition, science, modern Western reductive science itself is a religious colonization, is, is what uh, uh, she ultimately, uh, I think, argues. Um, and that's because, you know, nature is stuff that is there for human use, so on and so forth. So she wants to return to, or, or she argues in her methodology um, uh, that, you know, one of the things we need is, is some sort of return to animism, right? This means that if you get rid of the ideal human, then, then we have this emergent understanding, right? If we want to go to emergence theory or new materialisms or whatever, an emergent understanding of humanity means that there is just this many different perspectives. <laughs> it's multi-perspectival. Um, so we need to yarn, she calls it yarning and storytelling. We need to, our knowledge production is more like storytelling and yarning together perspectives um, on the world or a given phenomena or a situation or an event, right? Um, the more perspectives, the better. And this is not, uh, this is not anything goes. This is not um, alternative facts and, and, and um, fake news. I would argue that those perspectives themselves are couched in a form of certainty that denies any other perspective. So the conspiracy theories, um, this, I the, 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 um, this idea of an alternative fact and fake news depends upon not listening to anyone else <laughs> and asserting this to be true, right? It's a, it's a form of certainty. It's a form of theological, monotheological certainty that um, this is the one perspective. Um, 
And I don't think it helps for the left or for science-minded people to say, no, science is real, <laughs> um, or, or we're progressive. Um, or this is, we're, we're gonna couch, we're gonna like counter argue that with another form of certainty. That's also not helpful. Um, and so how do we t return to this sort of intersubjective value laden um, understanding of knowledge production together? Um, and I think we can do that by not stealing from and not misappropriating, but learning from um, other cultures that have a, a, a sort of more animistic understanding uh, or philosophies that have a more animistic understanding of the world because um, at least that gets rid of this sort of idealistic human, um, which I think is at the problem. So um, Rosie Bradati, um, of course, um, everyone here probably knows her, um, starts to do, the, do this with her understanding of the post-human. What the post-human convergence points to instead is a multi-directional opening that allows for multiple possibilities and calls for experimental forms of mobilization, um, different types of speculative fiction, <laughs> these sorts of things, discussion, and at times even resistance. The key word of post-human scholarship is multiplicity. So for me, post-humanism um, is not an attempt to get rid of our humanity. <laughs> it's not an attempt to um, flee from the earth. It's an attempt to open humanity as a concept and ourselves back up to the planet that we've evolved with and that allows us to exist. So post-humanism for me breaks open the modern subject into the multiple shifting assemblages that constitute any given subject. I'm gonna go there. And so this is, this is where, I, where I use the word planetarity. Um, I really uh, think Anat Singh's understanding, uh, Spivak's um, understanding, this, the, the idea of the planetary is particularly juxtaposed against the global view from nowhere, against the monological uh, transcendent view, and it's the bubbling up view of, uh, from, uh, from within. Um, and I'll just read this uh, because I like this quote. Um, uh, also, I love Feral Atlas. I don't know if you've played around with it a lot, but it's a, it's a fun, uh, for free, online um, uh, set of uh, papers, essays, documents. Other species as well as non-living things make it possible to be human. We're not human in spite of these things, but all the other things that are here make it possible to be human. That this statement is not obvious to many humans at this moment in time is only because of habits of thought that have become powerful over the last few hundred years. In this modernist mode of thinking, humans presume to transcend and master nature rather than forming worlds together with non-humans. One significance of recent discussion of the Anthropocene as a time of human-sponsored environmental crisis is that it urges us away from those powerful habits of thought. I mistyped that hobbits of thought. Anyways, um, the imagined mastery of humans no longer looks so successful. We are asked to reconsider the ways in which human and non-human histories are inextricably intertwined. The Anthropocene, like every other trajectory in which humans have been involved in, is more than human. And so how can the planetary serve as an imaginary um, <laughs> Uh, but with all of the critical theory that goes along with it, right? There's not sort of one planet. There are multiple interpretations of the planet, multiple perspectives that at any one time, at any one moment in the slice of nature naturing makes up the planet. So it's not a container. Um, and so I think what we need here is a sort of reattunement um, to the planetary context. What we need, I think, is what Mignolo identifies as a move from I think, I, I think therefore I am to I am where I think or I am where I do and think. Um, a thinking from, um, a, a multiple stories coming together to, uh, to, to describe uh, whatever we're trying to describe, right? Um, so undisciplined thought, basically, is what I'm getting at. And I love, I'm gonna end here because I want to have at least nine and a half minutes for questions and answers. Um, I think rather than looking to the stars, we should look to the dirt. <laughs> and I think Latour in his, one of his last books, um, he, uh, he writes, termites should be our role models because they do not lay waste to the earth, nor are any of them insect Elon Musks who seek to relocate to another planet. That's escapist. And I think we'll hear more about Elon Musk from Mary Jane a little bit later. But when you think in terms of a critical zone, you are locked in. You cannot escape. 
A critical zone is a space between two and three kilometers thick above and below the surface of the Earth, but all discovered life is within it. And so rather than looking to the scars, let's look to the termites. Um, and I'll end there. And um, I want to allow time now for discussion. Let me see if I can share the screen so that you can see all of these beautiful faces here. Hold on. Do, do, do. I'm trying to get, oh, here we go. I'm going to shut my email because I don't need to read my private emails. All right. I don't think I have anything embarrassing on my screen, so. Okay. Can you see? No, you can't see them. Hold on. Just one second. I'll try this again. Share screen. Still can't see. Still can't see them. Can you see them? Yeah, well, you can see everybody sort of on the side. Let me see if I can make this full screen. One second. Please, If you uh, just questions. stop sharing your screen, then we see everyone, I think. Stop sharing? Okay. But then they can't see. Oh, they can see you. Thank yeah. you. That was easy. <laughs> questions? <laughs> yes, please. I'm going to turn this around so you can see. Here you go. Wait a second. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Asan Habib. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm with the Concrete School of Journalism and Communication. My area of work is climate change communication. So I'm just here to learn, listen, and enrich my knowledge. Uh, I'm curious to know this is totally a new area of way of thinking, uh, the works you are doing. So what is it you are actually trying to achieve from this conference? Because uh, after coming here in the US in uh, just last year, I feel like that uh, disinformation and misinformation is so powerful in the US so it is really difficult to change something uh, as you can notice that in 1970s Exxon Mobil predicted the climate changes will happen just perfectly that is happening right now and they invested then uh, for the disinformation and uh, spreading lies so what is we gonna achieve uh, through this humanities initiative thank you So, I mean, I'll just, I mean, I can start off. I think one of the things that I hope for is much more of an education from early on of ambiguity, right? We're taught from an early age certainty, I think, in our educational system um, and the, the, the loose ends of fairy tales that tie up a children's fears and the sort of thing we're taught to be, to live in a world that is much more secure and certain than what actually is. Um, and so for me, this discussion, I hope will open us on to a much more uh, ambiguous way of, of thinking and being in the world. I don't know. Anybody else in the, on the Zoom wanna? Oh. Go ahead, Carol. I'll jump in. Um, to add to, to what Whitney has just said, from my vantage point, um, one among many purposes of this type of dialogue and to introduce these um, forms of what I call relational ontologies is to suggest that humans need to reconceive who and what who and what we think we are and that can inform our actions. As long as I think um, our contemporaries are wedded to outdated notions of what the human is and its relationship to other existence um, will keep repeating some of the problems. So to me, it's a radical job around reconceptualizing who we are. Anybody else wanna, other questions? If not, I'll give the, oh, go ahead. Other questions? I'll give the I'll give the panelists any uh, final comments. We have four minutes. We did well in time. Was Ahead there also. were there any questions that were sent from people that were watching the streaming? Not that I know of, but we will check one more time. But say something if you would like. In, in the meantime, final comments or reflections. I I will let others go first. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, since I had it, I, I, I won't, I won't do that. Um, I can, you know, I, I, I struggle with a lot of these, these issues, and part of it is retiring and moving to rural Wyoming, and, and kind of changing the people I hang out with on the weekends. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, it's, it, it, you know, I mean, talking about teaching children ambiguity and all that sort of stuff, you know, we're just trying to keep the don't say gay bill from being passed in Wyoming because we look to, uh, we look to Florida to be our role model for how to, how to deal with these issues. So, you know, and sort of thinking about how frustrating and how fraught uh, all of these issues are sort of personally for me, and then especially that the first lecture, I mean, that was, it, I mean, just, you know, my relationship with my animals and the, the relationship people have with animals here in rural Wyoming, even the relationship with cows who with everyone here is about to eat, uh, you know, and all those sorts of, of, of issues. You know, I, 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 I was watching it and all I could think of was, was the line, you know, the more I see of men, the more I like dogs, uh, you know, in, in part because, um, Thinking about the agency of animals, thinking about the agency of, of Sadie, thinking about the agency of Tommy, those are my my animals, um, you know, is is kind of a lovely space to, to occupy, uh, but it it's it I, I'm not sure how it ties in with thinking about you know issues of uh, you know some of the other issues that we're talking about. And I think I think this is what we have to try to articulate better as academics, why this stuff matters <laughs> uh, to, to people. We have to translate it into language that people that can understand uh, and then translate it into, uh, into sort of material realizations. Because I think I, I mean, I think I sort of know that, that I, mean, I know, I feel like I know on some level that thinking about you know, planetary agency, thinking about animal sovereignty and agency is, is great. But I, on the other hand, I, I'm, I would really like us to start thinking about other humans as human. <laughs> um, and so I don't know how to, how that all ties in no, there. I'm, thank you. No, I'm just thank babbling. You. You know I babble, Whitney. Why no, did you call it? No, thank you. No, and I think, I mean, one concrete example of, I think, why this matters is and we have to we have to close here um but is um exactly the mint julep history that ron DeSantis is trying to pull off in the educational system in florida have you ever heard of mint julep textbooks this was the uh after the civil war there were two different textbooks for history american history they called the all the textbook uh production companies called the ones in the south the mint julep edition and it was a whitewashed history. And that's exactly what DeSantis wants to do. And if we don't continue this sort of critical dialogue, right, then, then, then we get this whitewashed history and that breeds more and more violence against humans and against you know, the rest of nature. So I think this is, one, this is a concrete example of why, why this matters. But maybe you don't think it matters, but for sure you're ready for a break. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for being. Carol, go ahead, last word. Yeah, matter matters. Yes. Materiality matters. I think that for me is, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone online. We are like, we are in all different time zones, everybody on this call. So I, I, like, I love that. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for being here. And yes, Amanda. Okay, Amanda says bye. And we wish you were here in person, in the flesh. Thank you, Whitney. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye.